hello, my name is David McWilliams. I'm a consultant physiotherapist at University Hospitals Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust. And I've got over 15 years experience working within the critical care environment. I'm also an associate professor, and I've got a special interest in the early rehabilitation and recovery of patients surviving critical illness. In this video, I'm going to be talking about caring for patients who are confined to bed from the point of view of optimizing their respiratory function. I'll explain the relevant anatomy and physiology, and then explain how bed rest affects respiratory function. I'll talk about the complications that can lead on from this. And this video will also demonstrate steps that nurses and patients can take to improve ventilation. So let's look first at how the lungs work and how people breathe. But let's consider normal gas exchange and basic lung anatomy. And let's start with some basic definitions. Ventilation refers to the supply of oxygen through the lungs, whilst perfusion is the supply of blood to those lungs. For effective gas exchange to take place, these two things need to be in the same place at the same time. So how does this work? Well, as we breathe in, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract, increasing the size of the thoracic cavity, drawing air into the lungs. As the lungs expand, oxygen diffuses into the bloodstream via a vast network of capillaries, which cover almost the entire surface of the lung, with carbon dioxide moving in the opposite direction. Expiration then occurs passively as the muscles relax and the thoracic cage decreases in size, forcing air out and removing this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs with each breath is known as tidal volume. This is around 500 mils in a healthy adult male and around 400 mils in a healthy female. The overall effectiveness of gas exchange is affected by this tidal volume. But importantly, it's also impacted by something called functional residual capacity, or FRC. This is sometimes confused with residual volume, which is the amount of air left in the lung after we've breathed out as far as we can. The lungs will never completely empty, and there will always be some air left inside. This is typically around 1.5 litres in an adult male. Functional residual capacity, on the other hand, is the amount of air left in the lung after a normal breath out. In essence, it's the amount of air that we breathe on top of, and this is about three litres in an adult male. Another important volume we need to be aware of is closing volume, and this sits somewhere between functional residual capacity and residual volume, and represents the volume at which parts of the lung will start to collapse. So we can show the relationship between these volumes with the following illustration. So if we consider as somebody is breathing in, and they're generating their tidal volume and then breathing out, now on this next breath, if they breathe all the way out as far as they can, this will take us down to their residual volume, which sits down here. Now as that comes back up, you will see the lungs haven't completely emptied and there's still some air left inside. As we then move back up to tidal volume breaths, where they were breathing normally, this is where we consider functional residual capacity, which sits at this level just here. So it's the amount of air that somebody's breathing on top of. Now, the other important value we discussed was closing volume, and that sits somewhere nicely between functional residual capacity and this residual volume. And this is the point where when the lungs be go below that level, the airways start to collapse. When we start to consider the risk to our patients, it is this relationship between functional residual capacity and closing volume which becomes important, as when these two volumes meet, airway collapse occurs. The further the functional residual capacity moves below closing volume, the more significant the degree of collapse. As a result, anything that lowers your functional residual capacity or anything that increases your closing volume will cause problems that ultimately impact gas exchange and overall oxygenation of the body. Old age, lung disease or smoking are all factors that increase the closing capacity because they cause damage to the lung tissue, making it more prone to collapse. And often these factors are irreversible. As closing volume is at a fixed point for our patients, we need to focus on functional residual capacity as there are various factors we can use that increase it or actually various factors which can cause a decrease. One major factor, for example, that can impact functional residual capacity is pain following a rib fracture. If you imagine if you've broken a rib and it hurts every time you take a breath, the natural response would be to take shallow breath at lower lung volumes. This consequently will cause a reduction in your functional residual capacity, predisposing you to lung collapse and potentially secondary complications. So what has all this got to do with immobility? 
Well, one of the major factors which we know impacts our functional residual capacity is poor posture and a patient's position. When a patient is in a standing position, the lungs are stretched open, the abdominal contents are out of the way, and breathing is unrestricted. In comparison, when moving into a supine position, the lungs can lose up to a litre of volume from their functional residual capacity, and this puts patients at that increased risk of lung collapse and reduced gas exchange. As previously mentioned, this is particularly the case in patients who are older, smokers, or those with underlying lung conditions, where lungs become more prone to collapse. As we get older, lungs start to lose their elasticity. So what this means, well, at the age of 44, your closing volume moves higher than functional residual capacity in a supine position. By the time we reach 70, even in the absence of health conditions, the ongoing loss of elasticity means that closing volume moves above functional residual capacity and some degree of atelectasis or lung collapse occurs, even when we're standing. So when we consider the additional impact of losing up to a litre of air when moving into a supine position, you can see the risk of more significant collapse and respiratory compromise. This is why some of our older patients find it more difficult to lie flat. Alongside the changes seen in lung volumes, over time, staying in bed for a prolonged period leads to deconditioning, as discussed in video one in this series. This causes your muscles to weaken, and that includes your respiratory muscles. As well as reducing overall fitness and physical ability, loss of respiratory muscle strength also means a person's cough becomes weaker and less effective. As a consequence, it makes it more difficult to clear any secretions in the lungs and increases the risks of developing pneumonia. This then becomes a vicious circle. The weaker a patient becomes, the longer they spend in bed, and so the risks associated with bed rest intensify. If we consider my own particular area of interest, for those patients in critical care, where patients are sedated and breathing is taken over by ventilators, this respiratory muscle loss is intensified. Evidence suggests these patients begin to lose significant muscle in as little as 12 to 18 hours of bed rest. When someone is confined to bed, they may look okay, but it's easy to forget what's really going on inside somebody's body and the real risks of bed rest. Every day somebody is immobile, they are deteriorating from a physical perspective. We know the longer they are immobile, the more they will experience physical decline and the higher the risk becomes of developing secondary complications. So how can we try to prevent these complications in patients? Good positioning is crucial in optimising somebody's respiratory function and enabling them to maximise gas exchange. So let's look at some positions that are helpful. To support optimal lung volumes and increase functional residual capacity, we want patients to be in a sitting or even better a standing position. Whilst this isn't possible with those who are immobile, there are still things we can do to support lung volumes through the optimization of a patient's position. To improve a patient's respiratory function, you should encourage them to sit up as much as possible. All hospital beds have backrests which can be pulled out to a comfortable angle. You can arrange pillows to give support and comfort. They will need a pillow at the bottom of the back to provide support to the lumbar region and maintain the natural curvature of the spine. Build up support by layering pillows for the back and make sure the neck is supported too so the neck doesn't roll forwards. Patients should be encouraged to uncross their legs as this can strain their hip muscles and it is a good idea to add a pillow under the knees to take pressure off the hamstrings and reduce lower back pain. It can help to tie this upright sitting with functional tasks, for example, helping patients to sit up in bed at meal times to help with eating and digestion. They can also sit up and wash themselves in bed this way and do activities such as reading and watching television. If patients are not able to sit up independently, there are various aids you can use to assist them, such as a lifting pole. By pulling on this, they can lift themselves up the bed. But you need a reasonable amount of strength to do this, so a patient may need a carer's support to help them into a sitting position. Video two in this series shows you how to do this safely. If a patient is particularly weak, they would need to be helped into a sitting position using two carers. And remember, they are likely to need assistance with eating and drinking as they will be at greater risk of aspiration. When a patient is sitting up in bed, you'll want to avoid them getting into a rounding or slouching position. Being slumped is one of the worst positions you can be in and only mildly better than being in supine from a functional residual capacity perspective. It leads to discomfort because it puts too much pressure on the sacroiliac joint. 
It can also lead to abdominal crunching, which reduces functional residual capacity and restricts the capacity of the lungs to expand. So if the patient's bed can be adjusted to tip the head and leg areas, you can use a chair position to avoid this. This is a really good position for optimizing respiratory function. You can tip the bottom section down so the legs lower and you can raise the top section, allowing the patient to sit up. The patient is now in a chair position. Although the chair position is a good one, the problem is that often patients can slip or because they don't quite pivot in the right place, they end up inadvertently slumped. Electronic beds allow you to create a chair position in a singular movement so the back comes up and the legs move down. Some beds also incorporate a special backrest called an elliptical backrest that slides the patient back at the end of the movement so their bottom is in the right place and the patient doesn't slump. Of course, patients shouldn't be left in the chair position. Rather, the chair position can be incorporated into their daily repositioning plan based on an individual risk assessment or starting with 20 to 30 minutes each day and building up as the patient improves. If the patient is prone to slumping or lacks the support to maintain a sitting position, it may be more beneficial in these early stages to use alternate side lying positions. While this position is recommended for pressure care, side lying is better for improving functional residual capacity than the supine position. For those with respiratory problems, side lying is also beneficial in aiding secretion drainage and using the weight of the lung to stretch, open the lungs and re-expand any areas of collapse. For all patients confined to bed, the best advice is to maintain as much independent activity by the patient as possible. Where patients are weaker, vary their position ideally every couple of hours, but ensure the patient is sat up as much as possible.